Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Mikhailashvili. Welcome to the All Out Coach podcast, where leaders from different industries share their generosity, their character, and their legacy with others. Today, I have a very unique episode because I have a, an artist, a scientist, and a chef who's been able to transgress differences across many cultures. He's someone that inspired me because of what he believes, because of how he transforms other people. His name is Enzo Neri. He's a chef who has been able to energize not just a restaurant, not just his friends, organizations for which he's worked, but he's transformed and energized an entire country, Republic of Georgia, where I was born. And everyone who knows this individual knows the energy and the excitement that he carries. So, Enzo, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Enzo, from Republic of Georgia in Tbilisi. Hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. So uh, and so I'll say a few highlights from your career, but feel free to take us through your journey, through your journey as a leader as well. But what really inspires me about you is that you have a very, very unique and diverse background. You started in IT, right? And then the way you describe yourself is that cooking has never been your ambition. It's the way you express yourself. And when I read that first, as the way you describe yourself, it truly impressed me. You have worked in Michelin restaurants. You've had some great, great mentors in Italy. You are an acclaimed, acclaimed chef, recognized with many awards, best chef in Italy. And what you have done is you've taken your experiences and your vision and you've modernized cuisine in different uh, cultures. You've worked in New York, in New York City. You've been on the Food Network. Yes, I've seen yes, you. Yes, I did. I, did. And I, did uh, I was in a CBS television uh, with uh, Tony on New York and then I, I was also in, a, in Chopped and Food Network. You went to England. Uh, you worked at top restaurants there, Spain, right? Australia. You worked in D.C. In, in the United States as well. Yeah, I worked in Washington. Actually, Tyson Corner, yes. And then I, I connected with you after reading an article about you really being also inspired by Georgian cuisine, which is my native country. And anyone who knows me also uh, knows how passionate I am about the Republic of Georgia and about Italy, how, what a special place they hold in, in my heart. So that's, that's how I got to know you. But you're a chef that I think many people in my industry in the pharmaceutical industry where I work, could learn from. You learn about life and about yourself once you're able to integrate everything that you don't know with what you know, you know? <laughs> which, which you have an unbelievable curiosity with. And I think that uh, a lot of those who are going to listen are going to be inspired. So if you ever have been inspired in one hour, over this next hour, you will certainly be energized energized like you have never been. So let's hear from uh, Enzo. First question I want to ask you is if you can explain to me that quote, cooking has never been your ambition, but the way you express yourself. Is this your language? Is this uh, your emotion, cooking? Well, first of all, you know, thank you very much for your kind words. You know, you flatter with me. Uh, well, what it is, you know, because in the end of the day, um, uh, I wanted to do an art school when I was, when I was a teenager. And then my dad, being a scientist, he said, what are you going to be in your life? An artist? How can you, know, can you manage, you know, to, to survive, you know, to make money for yourself? And then, um, so I, I, I went through a different path. You know, I'm, I study IT and then I specialize in what we call a biomedical engineering services um but then um so that's why i said you know i cooking has never been my ambition i never had an ambition to become a cook to become a chef but then i realized um uh, then uh, cooking was something that was making me happy you know actually was the way i could express myself using heart and then i did an art in a culinary art because 
uh, in the end of the day, cooking is uh, uh, is playing with uh, with with forms. We playing with the volumes, playing uh, with uh, with colors, and also playing with smells. You know, with uh, with many you know so ingredients, many other things. So it's actually I was finding myself you know painting but making food. Yeah, some of the creations that I've seen you uh, you share with others are just unbelievable. As you know, I love uh, cooking myself. For me, it's also an escape. It's also a way of uh, expressing uh, my generosity and how I, I'd like to communicate with, with those people who I love and who I want to you know, kind of share, share my, my emotions with. But some of the creations that I've seen you do are just truly artistic. And that's why when I introduced you, I introduced you not just a chef, but an artist and a scientist. What, what is some of your favorites, let's say? What are your top three, like most artistic creations that you've come up with? Well, you know, well, you know my, mom, my mom has three kids. And my yeah. mom says, hey, I love <laughs> them in the same way. And yeah. For me, it's like, it'll be like with my dishes. You know, I don't really have something. Actually, you know what? I don't want to be identified with three dishes, Tim. I think, you know, then uh, because it is the way I express myself, um, it could be, you know, a day that I like to cook certain things and another day that I like to cook the other things. Uh, definitely, as a Mediterranean person, I love seafood. You know, I love play a lot with seafood and, uh, and fish. Uh, but also uh, uh, being uh, born and raised in Umbria region, you know, which is a Middle Italy, we have no sea. Um, I love also games, you know, I like rabbit, you know, I like pork, you know, like venison. So I don't know, I, I wouldn't tell you what is the, my three top dishes I like to cook because I really don't want to be identified with any of them. I would say to you then that as, as far as I, you know, a cooking is an expression of myself on that moment, on that day, on that situation, on that feelings, you know, it depends really how I feel and that's what I cook. Yeah. Now, who have been some of the mentors that you've had uh, who have helped you kind of become the chef, the celebrated chef across many co countries? Well, I, I was lucky then uh, in my own town. Um, there is the, a living chef called Marco Vistarelli. And at that time, he, uh, he opened in 1997, he opened a restaurant it's called Il Postale Restaurant in Marco Barbara. And he gained a Michelin star in 2000. And then uh, I was, I was the, you know, I was back on school. I was back in Culinary Institute, Università di Sapore di Perugia. And then I knocked his door and I said, chef, you don't know me because I've been living, uh, living uh, in Rome for the last couple of years. And, uh, even if I raised up here, um, I did university in a different city, but then I'm doing a school now. And then, you know, for me, this is like a, you know, a temple. And he said, okay, well, I, well you know, what time do you do school? I said, oh, I go there at nine o'clock, I finish at six. So he said to me, all right, you know, after six, just come and see what we're doing here. So that I was really lucky that he's, he allowed me to go and see what he was doing. And I, you know, be part of the team at that time, you know, after six o'clock. And then uh, when I, graduated and he offered me a job so uh, you know very luckily I started my career just for a Michelin star restaurant. So you started your career in a Michelin restaurant and then how soon did you decide that you wanted to travel Be because you've been to many countries that I, I, I you know I have not had a chance to go and you're very experimental when <laughs> not only uh, you're the food that you cook but also in the places that you travel so what 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 is it about traveling that you know well really appeal to I, you? Okay, I gotta I gotta do one step back you know in a, a couple of years before in 1999 I left Italy and I went to travel in Australia so I was in Australia now around a year and then uh, and that probably that trip it changed my mind it changed uh, the way of thinking um, so uh, when I when I was when I was working in Postale we had a lot of foreign people we had a lot of you know people come from abroad and try you know these, these people they these gourmet people they travel in the Europe you know with the Michelin guides on this end on the hands and then so they you know my uh, you know, like the experience in Australia and also this, uh, you know, this uh, abroad clientele we used to have in a postale restaurant, you know, made me to think like, hey, you know what, I should learn English a little bit better than what, I, you know, than what I'm doing now and, and see what's going on in on the different parts of the world and the culinary uh, scene. Um, and then uh, it was a guy that opened in 1971, 
a restaurant, an Italian restaurant in London, in a Poland street, actually in the center of London. Then um, I contacted and I said, hey, you know what, I had experience, a couple of years of experience in a Michelin star restaurant, you know, and he invited me to London to work for him. And so, you know, in 2003, it was um, October, you know, I left and, um, and, I, and I started my new experience in uh, the city of London, uh, in the United Kingdom. Yeah, and you came to New York uh, after London, right? I believe. No, I or... after London, I spent four years in Dubai. Oh, I in Dubai, four, that's right. Dubai, yeah. I, I, I opened Sofitel Hotel, I worked for a co group, then I developed a River Beach Club in Palm Jumeirah, and I opened a, an organic daily, it's called Sophie's, which has been awarded Best Gastro Cafe 2011. And then I, in uh, November 2011, I flew, I flew to London. I flew to, actually flew to Brooklyn. Sorry, to, to London, to New York. But it's actually to Brooklyn, to Cobble Hill. I know that New York uh, also has a very special place in your heart. So uh, what is it about New York that you miss, uh, that you always talk about in the, through so, across social media? Uh, well, uh, you know, there is... Uh, well, New York probably... If, you know, it's one of the, the top place in the world, you know, especially for, you know, also, also for, you know, um, the, the, the restaurant, uh, the hospitality industry scene. Uh, well, there is a lot of things, actually, that I love about New York. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, probably the, the, the fact is it's very cosmopolitan, you know, it's, it's, it's a blend of culture. And, and you know, and then whatever you want, whatever you want to experience, you just find it there. And also, I found the city uh, pretty easy to live. You know, and is everything is very handy. You know, everything is you buy your hands. Probably the things that I hated mostly was the weather <laughs> in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> it was too cold in the winter and a little bit too hot in the summer. And so, besides the fact that we both love Italian and Georgian cuisine, uh, you and I, there's another connection that I don't know if I have told you, but uh, the first restaurant that I went to when I came to New York, New York City, after I moved here, uh, was Gradiska, where you had been a chef in New York City. Yeah. That was the yeah. first restaurant that, where I, yeah, I had a great lunch with a friend of mine. So uh, you worked at Gradiska, right? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. I had, a, I had an opportunity in 2014 to be uh, the uh, executive chef and food developer of a new of, of a, an Italian concept. It's called Obica. So we yes. opened the flagship American Obica uh, flat iron. So it was in Broadway between 21st and 22nd. But then after this, you know, I took uh, I took over Gradiska. There is a West Village. Um, you know, on the 13th Street between seven and you know six and seven Avenue, um, in in New York City, yeah, uh, very cozy um, and traditional Italian restaurant with the uh, weather, uh, you know, with with a modern twist. That's all we say. Yeah, uh, you've uh, also given back, given back to those who want to become chefs. You teach, right? You. Uh, you're recently recognized in Italy uh, at, a, at a culinary school, right? Bufal, uh, the Bufalini, yeah. right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I've been, uh, the, the mayor and the, and the president of the, of the school, they decided to give me, you know, a recognition for my, for my career. Uh, so they invited me to the school. We did an event. We did, the, you know, we did a speech for the, for the new, for the, for the future chefs about my experience uh, you know 20 years ago in that school that was really really touching to be you know recognized for what i did in, you know in, in the last 20 years yeah just looking over your experiences uh, i want to make sure that those people who may not follow the culinary world truly appreciate just how one person can be a marketing resource just through their energy and the excitement that they, they, that you, they create because you are a, you personify the human ability to connect to connect and develop meaningful relationships across cultures and I hope that that comes across to those people who may be in different industries because I followed you very very closely you know, through the interviews, through all the fun interviews that you've been doing, where you sing, you know, you sing in Italian and Georgian, and, you know, you connect with musicians. You are a person who, I believe, loves life. And when you love life, you are able to 
inspire others and you you're you're naturally given that energy to uh, stretch yourself and to lift others and those two phrases are essentially the the, the model the slogan for all our coach and so so I want to ask you a little bit about leadership about chefs being leaders because I believe that a chef just just by the profession the nature of the profession are leaders how do you see leadership as a part of you being a chef well you know you're right I mean chef is a French word that I'm from chief that means boss you know so a chef is a um, uh, none of them, uh, the, you know, the boss of the kitchen. Um, I, I appreciate what he said about, you know, and, and energizing people and stuff. You know, I, you know, I believe uh, probably I have a, a gift as a, as a person and, you know, I, I'm very social. I love to, I love to communicate with people. Uh, I realize during the, you know, growing up with uh, a life is a very great gift. Um, because, you know, it's the most beautiful gift that you can have. And then I think, uh, and uh, we, we all, sh- you know, we all, all, of, all of us should inspire each other all the time. You know, I not try, not, no, I don't have a time to be miserable. You know, I have to find uh, a satisfaction. I want to tell you one thing. When I was uh, 20, I had to do, I was in the Air Force. And, you know, it, I had to do it. It was compulsory. You know, it was a military Air Force. And then it was depressing, you know. A lot of people at that time, you know, uh, take off their own life. You know, who, it was not, you know, that strong. Um, and then I thought, like, hey, I gotta find something, and I really, you know, I like to find something to find, to something to do to find satisfaction, or you know, to keep going for this year. Then I remember, and I was, uh, I was uh, a bartender, you know, in an officer bar, and um, and then he, I had this beautiful garden, we not, not, you know, with all the plants and flowers dying. So you know, I I, I start to buy a new soil, and then we plant the plant and flowers. Then by May, you know, during the spring. This guy was beautiful. So, you know, that's, that's what you have to do in life. You know, you've got to find something. And, and I'm lucky that I found, you know, that, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this job, this work, this lifestyle. And I really, I love it. But, but that's what you have to do. You know, you have to find something that really, you really enjoy. And then with this, you can transmit, you know, the passion and, uh, you know, and the beauty of it to other people. I think that's what uh, some people can be inspiring more than others just because they'd be lucky to, you know, to have found something they really love. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that... that uh, yes. on on my personal on my personal page all out coach I shared a post cooking like living for yourself has no taste is what I came up with. And the reason why I came up with was an observation that I had made and so that chefs always have someone else in mind uh, whenever they cook. Yes, they may cook for themselves because of necessity, because of the time that they have, or because they want to practice, they want to get it right, right? Very but, good point, very, very good yeah. point, because I never really cook for myself, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I, See, I, I want to just like go back and to say, like, well, what, is a, what is a leader? I mean, uh, the other day, leader is like, okay, you, you have your responsibility as a leader because you, know, you run a restaurant, so there is the business part of it. So it's a business in the end of the day, then you have to run it, you have to make money. Yeah. Uh, but then but, uh, your team, you know, your team is the people that are helping you to, you know, to, to, you know, to make those money, to make this uh, business successful. Um, and uh, the leader should be, should be able to, uh, to have the knowledge the techniques, you know, the capacity to do what, what you have to deliver. But also, you need to be like, inspiring. Um, you need to be a good teacher. You need to be, you need to be able to delegate jobs, you know. It's not having this, uh, you know, uh, micromanagement attitude, right. you know. You can't do De- everything yourself. Delegate when you inspiration rather than tasks. Outside, right? When you have 120 people outside sitting on the table waiting for your food, you can't thinking you've got to do everything on your own. So you have to be able to teach people to follow you. You know, it's a little bit like when you are a conductor of the orchestra, you know, you can't play all the instruments, to, you know, together yourself, but you can conduct yeah. them. You can tell how to play the flute, how to play, you know, the violin, how to play the guitar, the drums, and everything else. The kitchen works the same, it's a brigade. So you got all these people, you're going to teach them, you're going to train them, and you're going to be able to conduct them, to tell them what to do in the right time 
and you know, and be able to, you know, as I said, you know, to delegate the jobs, not to think like everything is gonna is gonna be done by yourself. You know, you have to be able to to do this with your with your kids, you know, with your team. Um, and that's, I think, is a good leader. So someone has the knowledge, someone has know how to delegate, someone has know a micromanagement attitude, um, and someone that can transmit, you know, the passion and the love for what they're doing. Uh, how have you been able to do that in a different con- country, in the Republic of Georgia? And it's clear that you've inspired so many young chefs because I see how they talk about you. You know, how, 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 how many emotions you evoke from others in a new environment. How are you able to consult and be a restaurateur, not just a chef, but also a restaurateur, and uh, bring to life some of the top fine restaurants in the Republic of Georgia, which also happens to be a very antique culture and the birthplace of wine with the biggest biodiversity of grapes. How have you been able to delegate and to mentor and to inspire in, Rep- in the Republic of Georgia? Well, Georgia particularly, because Georgia anyway is a foodie country and then it's getting more, more popular all over the world. And there is a lot of things beside me that is coming up, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, so there are things that, you know, there are people they, they want to learn and they want to grow and probably they so they recognize me, you know, and uh, one of, a, you know, a good, a good a, a, and a chef. They live in, in their own country. Um, um, I think that I think that's what it is. I mean, I, I inspire them because I have a lot of passion for what I do, and then I, whatever I do, I want to do in a proper way, in a professional way. Um, you know, also my you know, they they been acknowledged by, by my background, and which is not is not that bad. And um, that's probably how this, the reasons. Also. Um, I, I got used to travel, you know, I've been in a, nearly 60 countries in my life and I- 60 in countries? Europe. Yeah, yeah, I did it like 58, something like that. And then uh, I've been uh, opening a restaurant, you know, in Cyprus, in the Caribbean, in New York. Um, I've been redeveloped in London, in Dubai, uh, you know, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. So I had, you know, I had a few, few, different, uh, uh, few different experience, working experience. And first of all, I embrace the culture, you know, see, I'm not a guy that, you know, it goes somewhere and then he says, hey, you know, I'm Italian, you know, whatever. Right, you have an open mindset, right? Open mindset. Yeah, yeah I respect, the, you know, I respect the country that hosted me and then I want to know about them. Otherwise, I mean, I can, you know, I can you live and work with people if you don't understand the way they are, you know, because we are different, you know, and we might be similar in many other things, but we still have a different. I'm Christian Catholic, you know, here they're Orthodox. Um, you know, you, you might think, oh, okay, we're still Christians, but they are, we are different, you know? So we have a different, it's not, it's not a religion matter, it's, it's an education matter, that's what I mean, yeah. like, the way you grow yeah. up, you know? Absolutely, um, yeah. you, you know, sadly, if I, if I think about the 90s, the 90s for me was one of the best periods of my life, you know, growing up on the 80s and the 90s, economic boom in Italy, but if you think of what was in the 90s in Georgia, you know, you don't really want to think about it because it was under the war. So see, there are differences, you know, in, a, in the way we have education. But I, I do love embrace the culture uh, because the, the only way you can understand the people is when you understand the culture. And, and then I think it's like a sense of respect they have also for other, other countries and other countries' people. If I had the time, you know, I would probably be able to do maybe, maybe one half of everything that you are able to fit in into 24 hours. I, I often wonder, and so if your day is a 72 hour day versus a 24 hour day, just by how, uh, how much you travel, how much you post and you share your legacy and your inspiration with others, it's, it's, it's just unbelievable to me. You're bridging the social media and you're leveraging social media as well as being a person who's very social, very personable and approachable from what it seems like based on the, the open mindset that you have. Going back to Georgia and Italy connection, right? I recently sur- I surveyed, I surveyed uh, you know, a lot of Italians and Ger- Georgians of, in my network. And I said, you know, what is one characteristic in common? And what, one of the things that uh, the top, top characters was open character, you know, and that open character and that ability to connect with others, to love life is, I think, is my hypothesis. Uh, but I don't know, is, is that 
what you you believe is uh, is what has allowed you to stay in Republic of Georgia for three years and you know still feel feel like a Georgian, like a native, even though while conserving your true Italian patriotism, which is amazing. I think it's not just that. To be honest, it's, it, 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 there is many many things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, Georgia is is a uh, a growing market and it's always appealing when it's a growing market you know i found myself uh, someone with an international experience that can uh, bring you know some experience to share and to help the growing market i I'm, I'm i'm linked to georgian people because i have a very good friend which is gia piradashvili and he's been a friend or the father of one of my best friends for 25 years um, and that was the, the, the first, uh, you know, the main um, uh, reason why I came to Georgia the first time. Uh, I found Georgia very similar to Italy in the 90s. Not in the 90s as, as a retrograde country, no. Because Italy in the 90s was amazing. Everybody was going out. Um, you know, if you go now in Italy, apart a few, you know, big cities, the, the small villages, the town, they're deserted. People don't go out anymore. Yeah, people still love to gathering together, still love to go out, you know, mm -hmm. and to, and to, and to spend time together, to drink wine, you know. Those, are, those things I really missed, you know, um, from, uh, from Italy. And Georgia still has it, because people, they really love to be together. Um, there are similar to Italians, probably. I would say Italians are very diverse from north to south, and probably Georgia are very diverse if you go to the villages in Kakheti or to go to Guria or if you go to Ajara or if you go, you know, to Tbilisi. Um, and probably uh, Emiratian people that are different with Kakhetian or, or Megralian. But, uh, have you know, noticed those differences already in the short time there, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Regional differences. You have, huh? Oh, okay. Great. That's great. I, I can recognize I can recognize him Ukraine, like, you know, even for the way he looks, you know? Wow, wow. You know what? When I go to Italy, by the way, and so I also have learned a lot of the regional differences, not only in the culinary world, but also in the cultural world. You know, I've, I've recognized those differences in, yeah. uh, across the different regions as well in Italy. Yeah, now. of course. That's, that's what yes. I'm saying to you. Mm -hmm, you get someone from Sicily and you get someone from Trentino Alto Adige, you put them together, you say, are they Italians? You know, like, you know they're completely different. We've been conquered by everyone. I mean, in the north, the northeast of Italy, that was, uh, the, you know, the Hungarian, Austrian Hungarian Empire. So they were like Germans and Austrians. Then uh, Piemonte Lombardia, until the third um, independence war, was under Napoleon III, they were French. You go the south, the south was the reign of the two Sicily. They were Spanish, you know, Catalonia. Um, you know, they're completely different people, you know, French, you know, Austrian Hungarian, you know, and the Spanish people, completely different people. Do you know Mazzini and Cavour, the two yes. politicians that uh, helped sure. to, you know, Garibaldi to unify Italy? In the end of the day, they said, we did Italy, let's do the Italians. You know, so they. they <laughs> Well, it, it, Italians are very diverse. It's very sometimes you, you know people have this stereotype of Italians, which is me as an Italian, I, I can't really recognize it. But I, but there are there are certain things that we have in common. You know, it's, it's, you know the uh, this uh, this high sense hospitality. You know, uh, Georgian they are generally nice people, and I think also Italians are very generous and nice. Um, so, you know, I, I see similarities between the two, the two countries. Also, uh, Georgia is divided by regions, as Italy has been divided yeah. by regions, you know. So even in this, you know, you go, of course, now we are a peninsula. So we go the, the, the west, the east, the south coast. You have only the coast, you know, on Batumi, down on the, on the Black Sea. But, but you know, that you got Kakheti, for example, the wine region reminds me, you know, a little bit of Umbria and the certain part of Toscany. You know what I mean? I, you know, I can feel it. I, I, I don't like to compare them because they're two completely different countries. But I do have a feeling that reminds me a certain part of Italy, you know, and, and, uh, and Georgia. Also, I love the, the medieval part of Georgia. You know? Me growing up in Umbria, then uh, we lived a lot, you know, we have a, um, you know, we, we lived a lot the medieval time and also the, the Renaissance time, you know. I, I like all this architecture that sometimes you find around. Um, also in an old city of Tbilisi.
Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah, I, I can, uh, you know, I feel Georgia very close to me, more probably than all the other counties I've been living with. Great. I'm glad to hear you say that, particularly because all the Italians that know me, they know how much I praise Georgia when I go to Italy. And then all the Georgians that know me know how I praise Italy when I go to Georgia. So they're like, wait, are you Georgian or are you Italian? And then the Italians say to tell me, hey, not even five minutes goes by without you mentioning Georgia. You know, but yeah. I have a way to connect the two because I want to connect different people of different cultures so that they know more about each other's cultures. And that open mindset is one of the reasons why I do that and the passion that I have for the two cultures. Yeah. In fact, you know, I work in the pharmaceutical industry 15 years. I'm American more than anything else. Now I live here in the United States 30 years. I go to Georgia all the time. I have ties to that. I'm very tied to Georgia. I go to Italy a lot, yeah. as you know. But, but what I often say to them is, is uh, that there is a connection between these two countries. In fact, when I first meet some of the researchers and investigators, I tell them about the Republic of Georgia but without even before getting into, let's say, uh, the business, uh, before talking about re latest research or how I can involve them in some of our company activity. One of the reasons is because I want them to understand my background so that they know me, get to know me as a person, what matters to me, you know, because the function that I uh, hold uh, is, is based, is dependent on developing the relationships over time. You know, with even Nobel Prize laureates, some incredible researchers, and you know, when, uh, when I tell them uh, where I'm from, I want to evoke emotions, just like you evoke emotions out of people. And that's what I'm focused on in this stage of my life and career, to add energy, to add excitement, and to add character to my industry, which I think is at a, in a transformational stage now, pharmaceutical industry, which helps millions and billions of people with, with medications, right, advancing medicine. Uh, but there are still things that we can do even better, how we can collaborate together. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of my colleagues are going to hear this and they're going to probably get to know you and get to know me better. And they'll, I hope that they'll understand how they can integrate many different areas of their personal life into their professional life, because that's what social media is doing. That's what LinkedIn is doing now. A lot of people are posting on LinkedIn a lot of personal aspects of their life. And uh, yeah. people in the professional world, they're wondering, why is that? It's not another Facebook. But you can't escape the fact that you have to take and learn from life, uh, from different aspects of life, just like you have, right? From different cultures and different uh, specialties. But that's a little bit, in a nutshell, why, why I really wanted you to be here. Because in All Out Coach, I have four different series on this podcast which are leadership, mentoring, company culture, the pharma industry. So you are a person that cro crosses and extends borders, extends boundaries. You probably fit all of them, but being a scientist as well and leadership and mentoring and everything. If you were a scientist, what, what, where would you uh, work or what would be your specialty? What would be your interest? Well, I would be interested in food. <laughs> in food, in the science of food. food. Okay. Was I not? Was I know like, uh, you know, a scientist, you know, and then uh, I left what I was doing because, uh, you know, I wanted to, yeah, see, I love, I love scientists, you know, there is so much scientist in cooking, you know, cooking is nothing else than denature that break down proteins. You're breaking down proteins, you know, uh, using uh, um, different methods, it could be, you know, adding the heat, or a cold, or an acidity, or an alkaline, you know, it just uh, do a chemical process. Then it would break down the protein and it makes the food. So in the other day, I do chemistry, you know, so I do sciences, but I, I, I do with food because food has such, so much more than uh, just, just sciences, because yet the results of the sciences, it's just pleasure, it's a pleasure in your eyes, in your you know, in your nose, in your, in your palate, in a, in a smile of the people, you know, in the happiness, in a, on experience, in a, the enjoyable night. You know, there is so much about the hospitality industry. But, I'm, you know, I don't know. I, I think, like, uh, I was a scientist and I decided to work in a, you know, in a scientist, you know, a food environment. 
uh, yes, uh, I, there is, you know, uh, people often uh, kind of wonder when they ask me what I do, you know, and I tell them I work in the pharmaceutical industry and I develop relationships with researchers, right? Uh, yes. Across, the, across the, the country, right? But I also, I also love to cook and I, it's, it's a passion of mine. Yeah. Dude, right? And I think that, I, yeah, you're doing yeah. It well. thank you. you. Know, that, that means a lot that to me coming from I'm you. Impressed. I'm <laughs> impressed. I'm very curious to try your pizza dough. That looks <laughs> pizza, looks yes. Like you, you do what many people cannot really understand. What does it mean raising up, you know, a dough for 36 to 48 hours? You know, it's, you know, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing what you do it. That means a lot to me coming from you, and so the reason why I wanted to kind of tell you about my passion also is because of that connection that that I have, and you were talking about science, having a pharma pharmacy degree, doctoral degree, right? It's about chemistry, and that's what I've I've uh, discovered also that yeah. the variables like time and temperature are so important, are so important. Uh, you know, they're not variables but they're actually ingredients. There's one book by a person who was in the corporate world for many years, and uh, he left business, and he began to learn how to bake, uh, kind of transform his focus in business. One of the most memorable moments from that book that I remember is that time and temperature are ingredients, which is very true, which what I've discovered making, let's say, pizzas based on authentic Neapolitan Dough and, and, and I think it's important to not just uh, look at recipes and learn recipes, but try to figure out systems. Because once you know about time and temperature and the science, right? one yeah. of my friends, Stefano Callegari, a very successful pizza guy that invented the uh, trapezino, yes. he says he says one of his quotes is the dough is not a recipe. You know, he says like it's something you have to fill. You said really good things about, you know, time, you know, temperature, you know, usually they are inversement proportional with each other, but also the environment. You know, you know, when you make a dough, you have to be careful of you know, the humidity, the quantity, percentage humidity, you know, there's so many other things that are involved. It's actually, you know, when you go through a bakery and, and pastry, there is so much more chemistry than, you know, than, than in the, in, I would say, than the start of the standard cuisine, you know, than the standard cooking. But now, you go, if you think now, one of the last 20 years with the molecular gastronomy, you know, there's, there's also so much more, you know, chemistry involved or attention to chemistry because it's always been a chemistry. But before it was just, you know, methods. Then a grandmother will tell to your mom and then your mom to the kids and blah, blah, blah. But now there are people, they study actually, you know, more in laboratory what's going on when you cook. So there is, you know, we actually identify, you know, this uh, chemistry, um, you know, and, and, and a chemical process during the cooking. But, you know, bakery, bakery and, 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 and as I say, pastry has even much more than that. You know, there's all the environment behind, you know, around it. Um, then it can, uh, you know, can uh, influence, you know, the, the results of, of, the, of, the, of the recipes. Yeah, seeing many of your dishes really makes me think how much more I need to really learn about the science of food and the science in the culinary world, yeah. other than the science of medicine, which I've been concentrating on, because uh, some of the creations are just incredible that I've seen. Doing the foam and doing, using some of the nitrous oxide, right? Look, look, who introduced, there are many chefs, and especially the Spanish ones, you know, from, yeah. from Ferran, Adriano, you, you want to take an English guy that is, you know, Houston Blumenthal, all these people, they, 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 they brought this kind of, of a, a kitchen, you know, cuisine level, and, you know, the, the cuisine techniques is to another level, you know, and then uh, you can find out in the markets a lot of the different products. Ferran Adriano makes texturas. Um, then we can, you know, you can play, you know, you don't use maybe gelatin anymore, you use agar-agar, which is a natural gelatin, you know, which is, uh, a, a, you know, a, a seaweed that has been dried, or you have a xantana, which is a gum, and it helps you to, uh, as, as a thickener, you know, so you don't use the flour anymore, and it gives you a better, you know, a, 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 better, a better taste. So there are other elements that today has been discovered, and you can use it. You know, or the, the lecithin, the lecithin helps, you know, to make foams, you know, to make these air foams. Um, because, you know, they, 
the, the chemical reaction and then they happen between the different molecules from the molecules of the fat, molecules of the liquids, and molecules of the air. You know, I always wonder, is it possible to eat tasty and live healthy? What do you think? <laughs> I think there is, you know, uh, that I, I don't like extremisms, okay? And there is always this, uh, probably a marketing way, you know, to talk about food, you know. Yeah. Today I was actually, you know, I said, oh, vegan, you know, that's, you know, that's very wealth in a very, very healthy, you know, and I'm thinking, well, you know, you need some proteins as well, you know. So I think the real diet that we, all of us should, you know, should, uh, should, should have an approach to, it's uh, a balance, you know, that's for everything. In, in life, everything's about balance, you know. I'm a Libra, so I know a lot about balance. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always researching the balance. You know, even like, you know, fry some chips is not that bad. You know, the oil is completely new. You know, it, it doesn't go to the smoking point. You know, so everything can be done, you know, can be eaten. You know, as far as if you do it, you know, you balance it, you know. And, and um, you know, if you, if you take Italians, Italians, they're not really fat people, but we eat pasta every day. But you know, we eat pasta with a certain, you know, uh, using unsaturated fats, or certain uh, uh, sources that are not that greasy, and that we eat uh, uh, carbs during lunchtime, so we have uh, the rest of the day to actually digest you know, and burn the, the energy of the calories, you know, with the energy that the calories, you know, Absolutely. The, the carbs we have. So, you know, I think it's really like the, the real, the, the, the best diet, and um, it's, it's, you know, a balance, you know, balance. And you know then, uh, you know, as an Italian, you know, we, you know, we have this Mediterranean diet that actually has been, uh, has been, uh, has been discovered uh, by, um, you know, by by, by an, an American officer. You know, was a medic, American officer. Then he realized that uh, the soldiers that were fighting in Italy, they had the less problems. You know, the other soldiers in the rest of Europe because he realized that the the, uh, the alimentation, the food that they were having, it was much more healthier. You know, it was based on legumes. Uh, you know, was based in, uh, you know, extra virgin olive oil, you know, tomatoes, you know, vegetables, um, you know, and, and that's, that was the result. It's amazing uh, to me to see the evolution of a lot of the new cuisine and new products that I see. I um, want to ask you about how you coach the next generation chefs in terms of modern uh, modernization of the cuisine is it in the ingredients is it in the style what is your focus mostly on uh, well i i focus a lot on ingredients look if, if you take a georgia georgia yeah. has some exceptional ingredients take mm -hmm. the tomato for example take the badrijan you know the eggplants take some other stuff but the variety is not that big compared with italy that we have you know, honestly, hundreds and hundreds and, you know, a different uh, uh, vegetables that you might not really find here. You know, here it's very difficult now for me to find the radicchio or, you know, before it was, you know, or, 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 or I don't know, a romaine lettuce, uh, for example, or finocchio, you know, the fennel. Um, right. So I think, first of all, if you want to paint, you're going to know the colors. Right. You know, if you don't know, have a knowledge of the colors, you can't paint. So if you're going to make good food, you're going to know what a good, a good ingredients are and, then, and how they taste it. You know, when you have experience, you think about one ingredient, you, is, you think here and you feel here in your mouth. You don't even need to eat it. You know, you just feel it because you remember it. You know, it's something that, you, you know, you, you have this uh, database of the ingredients because of your experience, you know. And that's the same, uh, actually, the base of the ingredients and the flavors that you acquire, you know, since you're a child, since you're a kid. So, first of all, it's ingredients. You need to know, you have to have knowledge of ingredients. You need to know the basics. You need to know the basics. You can't not build the future if you don't know the past. Um, tradition, true, you need to know where you come from. But as Massimo Bottura say, don't look at the tradition with nostalgia. Tradition yeah. and evolution. So you know the tradition, knowing the tradition, make an evolution, you know? Um, and then, you know, techniques. Because that's a good point. Look, um, if you take the medical, uh, the medical field, yeah, okay, of course, you know, we have always new uh, disease. So we, 
make much more new discovering, you know, um, especially working on cells and, and, you know, and molecules. But that what it is actually, the avant-garde of the, of the medicine field is actually the technology. I mean, the diagnostic, the way you can actually today, you know, find out with an X-ray, with an RMI, you know, with a CAT scan, all these things, you can find, you can see things on a real time that before were taking like ages. So same in the food. Today we have a certain, you know, technology, a certain machine, machinery that, you know, uh, helps us to do many things, you know, in another way, in a quicker way. You don't have it just a blender. You have a thermomix. You have a blender that actually brings up the temperature. So you cook and blend at the same time. You get a paco jet. You know, it's blades and it runs at 14,000 RPM. Then when you, you know, when you blend something, you actually whip this. Um, I don't know. You have so many other machines today that helps you. you know, sous vide. Sous vide has been discovered. It was in 1974 by a French guy. But today is everybody you not know, cooking sous vide. Many, many reasons. Many, many reasons. Many, many advantages of that. What, what um, is sous vide for those of us who are going to listen who don't know? Right. Sous vide is a French word. It means uh, sotto water, you know, without, with, under pressure. Without under pressure. Air. So you, you put a, your ingredients under the bag, you take off the air, so you make it in a, a anaerobic environment, and then you can cook uh, in a dip inside of the water that's being circulated by a thermostat that keeps the temperature at the same time. So you can cook slowly for a longer time. So why? I want to cook a chick. A chick has a lot of... Uh, a lot of the collagen has a lot of fibers, okay? Mm -hmm. And then to break down the proteins, to break down the fibers, I need more time, you know, in, slow, in, a, in a slow temperature. Um, and that's why, you know, it, it, sous, sous vide comes along. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, you can cook respecting the breakdown temperature of a single protein. I can cook with a circulator an egg. I can boil an egg or can poach an egg. It's 64 degrees. Okay, for 47 minutes. And then when I open the egg, it's completely cooked, but inside, you know, the, the albumin is, is still, is, is not, it's not chewy, it's not gummy, um, and, the, and the yolk is still running, it's not sandy. You know, so you go through a, a perfection of cooking, respecting, you know, the time and then the temperature of the protein, the protein you want to break down. And so thank you, guys, if you're listening, you probably understand now that I was not exaggerating that this man is a multi-talented chef, but a scientist at his core. All right. So, I, no, thank you. And so once we understand the root cause of what we do, you know, and the systems of what we do, we can apply, apply techniques that are yeah. not going to be limited to one recipe, but to to many, many more recipes, right? And to uh, the way you can maybe change one aspect, one variable uh, about, about, a re about a recipe or how you look at something that you've done traditionally, but do it differently. I mean, in fact, the first article that I wrote about you was about the chocolate uh, version of the Hinkali, which is a national dish in Georgia, right? The chocolate ravi uh, ravioli, which we have a, our own and, and cousin too, right? <laughs> A lot of the orthodox, traditionalist, conservative didn't like that much. That I'm did. sure. <laughs> yes, but in science also, a lot of people did not like blood transfusions when they were first yeah. uh, introduced. But, you know, let, me, let me tell you, you, know, you know, right? this, is funny. this is funny because, to be honest, this is not even an invention. You know, a chocolate ravioli, they bring right. out... They exists bring in Italy, Italy, right? Not in Italy. many years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but not, not only many, many regions in a different way, but it's something that goes back to 17th century. Okay, so well, it was a magazine. They asked me, Enzo, can you come up with a, a Georgian dish in Italian way? And then the, the first things come out of my mind was the kinkali. You know, kinkali is the dumpling, you know, with the meat inside. And I want, in an you know, only meat, you know, you can do also vegetarian. And just so thought, okay, this is an amazing dish. What can we not do a dessert, you know, a dessert dish out of it? Uh, in the end of the day, the only things I used was the shape of it. Um, and then, uh, find a similarity with the cheese that you have, a kind of a cottage cheese, and we have a ricotta, you have right. nadugi. Nadugi, so yes. I said, okay, in Italy we do this ravioli with the ricotta, I'm going to use nadugi. You know, you have a beautiful nuts, I'm going to put inside some nuts, like walnuts, you know, hazelnuts, 
you know. So the only thing is I did, I said, hey, I want to take one dish which is very popular in, in Georgia. I want to use the ingredients of Georgia and I want to make something that reminds me Italy as an homage to Georgia. And that was probably someone too, too you know, conservative didn't get that. You know, for me, it was just a much, you know, it was a, a present, it was a gift in a honor of this great cuisine, which is, you know, the Cartuli, Cartuli uh, kitchen, Cartuli cuisine. Yeah, and the list of similarities between Georgia and Italy is, I think, endless. You know, I've thought about them many times and I constantly explore them. But, you know, if you want to talk about, let's say, uh, last names, last names ending in vowels, Georgia and Italy are the two countries, right, with all the last names, or most, right? In, in Italy, you have the, the Latin names, right, the Santis and so forth. But um, for the most part, all the last names end in vowels, right? You have the Etruscan texts that are now uh, decodified and that by Georgian grammar, in fact, by one part of Georgia in Svaneti, which has never really been conquered by other people, right? The Svan dialect, well, the Svan language is one that I don't know, but exploring some of these linguists' work, for example, Svanetian uh, grammatical structure explains, has helped linguists explain the Etruscan text. And I know you're from Umbria, which has a lot of Etruscan uh, influence. Then you have other similarities, um, like the cheeses, the breads, the pizza, we have the hachapuri, right? The raviolis, trincali, the naduri, all the cheese. Yeah, you got a peperonata, uh, you got a jap sandali. A jap sandali is very similar to, to, you know, caponata in Sicily or a peperonata italiana. You know, it's really, you know, you got all these vegetables, you know, uh, you know, braised and cooked and then you finish up on them, you know, and tomato stuff. Yeah, I know, there is so many. The lobbio, lobbio, the way you do the lobbio, you know, I grew up eating the kind of fagioli, you know, in Italy. There's so many. But, you know, I'm always saying this. Sometimes it's really silly to define cuisine of different countries because people were traveling, they were explorers. I mean, look. Of course. We are, we are famous for tomato. Tomato San Marzano DOP. We are really famous. We didn't yes. have tomato. But you, of course, it came from the United States, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, then, then we're talking about 15th century. From America. The, mm -hmm. the potato. Lobbio as well. You know, the beans. You know, all these things. So, you know, we actually, that's, we go back on what we stand before, you know, traditional in evolution, you know, food has always been evolved. Always of course, been evolved. yes. And yes. I, I don't understand why probably sometimes, probably now evolves quicker, okay, because everything's quicker. Um, but, you know, the spices, you know, Marco Polo, they went to the, you know, to the India, bring, brought back the spices, you know, we in, in Sicily is very Arabic. And we got the you know pistachio or you know, almonds, um, yeah. you know the rings, the way we dry you know the, 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 the fruits and stuff. Probably that's you come comes from you from uh, from Persia, you know, from the Ottoman Empire. You know, it's so much you know happening in two thousand years. I'm telling you, like, the last two thousand years of of, of history. Where I want to give another example. Allow me to tell you this. Sure, um, answer. If if I tell you tempura. That you right away think about Japanese Japan, tempura, right? Okay, yeah, all right. But tempura is actually a term. They come from Latin tempura. Tempura tempo was the land, was the fasting time. Then uh, the Portuguese going and bring the, the you know the Christianism, Catholicism to 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 Japan because during the Quaresima, the forty days before Easter. They could right. not, they were fasting, they could not eat meat. They were deep frying fish and vegetable in this little buttering. They were called pastel, they were called, um, sorry, tempura. So actually tempura has nothing to do with Japanese. It was, you know, a Portuguese uh, way to deep fry vegetable and stuff. So- I did not know I'm that. Like, yeah, that's- a... yeah, yeah, you can, you know, you can Google it and I'll have a look. No, no, I trust you. Yes, yeah, you know, absolutely. Tempura, Tempura is a Latin, it's a Latin uh, word that comes from tempora, which is in Italian means tempo, so the land, you know. Um, you know, so there is no really border between cuisines. Yeah, there are the way cuisine developed in different countries uh, before, be, probably also be, be, because of the, the climate. You know, why in south of Italy everything is more spice? It's more spicy because it's much more hotter. So the spice would... Uh, 
uh, would lower your pressure, your blood pressure. So you will feel a little bit hot in the beginning, but you will feel released and, you know, and more fresh after you eat. In the north of Italy, it was cold. They didn't need to, you know, to, to lower the pressure. You know? yeah. That's why a lot of hot countries, they have, you know, Chile, you get Mexico, you get India, you, know, you go to Sri Lanka, you go to some part of Asia. You know, it, it's very important to understand the environment, to understand the culture. You know, it's very important. But also, what I want to say is that what you're saying on the similarity between foods, you know, it's just because, you know, there is no really border with each other, you know. They are just the way they've been probably originated and the way they develop, you know, through the years because of the environment. Living in the United States, I can tell you that I've met people from so many different ethnic groups and cultures that I've never, I had never a chance to before. And one thing that I've, I've truly realized is that we have a lot of common fallacies that we have to get over. And there are many more things in common that we all have than differences. And what makes us different is not really where we come from, what religion, what background, what language we speak, what we say, but what we do ultimately, I think. Yeah. What we do and, you know, how we behave. And uh, right. you know, I, that's, that's one of the points that I like to get across when I coach outside of work, at work, uh, try to find similarities. And your open mindset, you know, what you do is, is personifies and really, for me, is very, very natural and genuine. Uh, and, uh, you know, talking about history, how history as well as environment influences, you know, the culture of cuisine also uh, from an environment perspective. One hypothesis that I had made was that the reasons for the cheeses tasting similar, similarly from Georgia and Italy may be just the, the environment, the kind of milk. For example, if you want to make a Georgian suluguni, right, which is our version of mozzarella or fior di latte, right? Or like imeruli, which is similar to, let's say, primo sale, Italian primo sale cheese, cow's milk, right? Fresh, yes. fresh cheese. Uh, yes. I, I think you can never get that same taste if you make that cheese here. And that's why, you know, I always, when I travel, actually, you know, I'm more conservative than you are. So I'd like to travel to those cultures and co countries where I like the food and when I know the language. So I limit, that's why I want to learn all the languages the rest of my life uh, so that I can travel a little bit more. Look, um, very, very true. I'm sorry if I interrupt you. Very sure, sure. Why there are uh, legislation um, in Europe about this, you know, Parmigiano Reggiano means it's the cheese from Parma. From Parma. Yeah. Emilia. Okay. So, yeah. If you, if you use the milk, not from the region, if you don't uh, make the, the, the cheese on that region, what that kind of environment, with that kind of humidity, with that kind of bacteria, because that's what people have, you know, forget about it. You know, a cheese, you make with bacteria, with enzymes and bacteria. Those bacteria are on the area. So that cheese will never be the same or whatever in, 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 in other part of the world unless you really find something really similar to that. So, and and so my, new hypo yeah. my new hypothesis is that it's not just that the people may be similar in Italy and Georgia, but the cows may be genetically similar as well. Yeah. And there's evidence yeah. for that, by the way. <laughs> Genetic that's studies. Why they, no, that's why they exist in this legislation or this DOP, Denominazione d'Origine Protetta, you know, the origin you know, it's protected, you know, because il, il culatello di Zimbello, which is you, I met, cannot import it to, to America because the USDA says we don't do it in the right way. Yeah. Il culatello di Zimbello is one of the most expensive piece of a, of, of, of a charcuterie. You know, it's made in Zimbello. There is no other people that do it in Italy. There is no another way you do it. You do it in Zimbello, that's it. And if you, if you actually Google it and you see some of the videos, they show you in the morning, they open the, set, you know, they open the windows to bring, to bring this breeze you know, and this air for the area. You know, that would mature you know, the charcuterie in that way they want it. You know, and so this is, a, this is very, very specific, actually, very, very specific on the region, on the ingredients. And also, even if there are similarities between... Uh, you know, the way we do cheeses and the, and the, the, the results of the cheeses, it's very important actually, you know, we, we recognize, you know, the origin of it, you know? Yeah. 
<laughs> it's also it brings us to those emotions those that nostalgia that we felt at that time when we tasted we compare everything based on what we've tasted before based on what we've oh. seen what we've uh, touched right and uh, based on our five senses so for example think of, the, think of the soup in a ratatouille movie you know when you have this you know the sip of the soup in a ratatouille and then he goes back to his grandmother you know like whoo just go back on that feeling yeah very true yeah. very true and I'll give you two examples from my life. Two friends of mine from Naples, from Napoli, and they brought some uh, cheese, fior di latte, from Sorrento, you know, from Latteria Sorrentina, and it's fresh milk here in New York. And I had guests here. I had uh, some family guests. And I, after I opened uh, the case, right, with the, that milk, it brought me back to the Republic of Georgia. Even though this cheese uh, is not the same environment. It's not DOP Sulguni, for example, but it was similar. It was so similar that it brought me back to those matters. And what I wanted, what I did was I came home. My guests were from Georgia. I didn't tell them where the cheese was from. As soon as they saw it, it was three of them. And so, so my hypothesis worked in three of them. They said, is this Sulguni? You know, just by the, t and then when they tasted it as well, not just uh, when they smelled it. Another point uh, about taste that I'll, I'll make is that I uh, grew up in the Republic of Georgia, but I came here and I've spent most of my life in the United States, right? I was actually 10 years old, but when I tasted the uh, Georgian wine uh, brought from Georgia, I was 18 and it was in the United States here. And as soon as I tasted it, even though I hadn't really drank probably much wine, right, before age of 10, it brought me back to the, to the grapes in, in the Republic of Georgia, you know, to that, uh, to our taste. So, yes, maybe it's, it's just, it's a familiarity. It's, it may be something that... What was I, that? What was that? Saperavi? What was that? It was a Saperavi. It was a, no, no, actually it was a white wine. And so it was a Cazzitelli. It was a Cazzitelli, Cazzitelli but I... One of my so, favorites. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not a connoisseur of wine. You know, I try to remember the grape and the region. I love many Italian wines, many Georgian wines. But what really sticks in my mind about that moment was how I was able to really recognize. And to this day, I can, I know what an authentic Georgian cheese is or wine is versus others. You know, so yes, we say that uh, we have some of the oldest, oldest wine drinking vessels, right? The amphoras that we call quavery things like that. Yes, we have the, some of the oldest wine drinking vessels, but it's something that we're familiar with. So I always say when I meet, you know, physicians also, when I talk to them about wine, that look, it's the oldest, it's in the Guinness Book of World Records, but I don't say it's the best. I don't say it's the best. It's just something I'm familiar with. And it's, you know, that's all. <laughs> that's something that makes me, me, and that, that, you know, that allows me to kind of transmit those emotions. Uh, even in, with those researchers who have much more experience in things that I than I do, right, in their specialty. Yeah. But when we get together and when we share those emotions, that's what allows relationships to develop. And that's really what you do so well, you know. And so and I, in this last few minutes, uh, I want to ask you what you would like to see in the next generation of chefs, of leaders. Is there something that, is there a message that you want to share uh, with, with well, us? Well, I, I have one message, actually. In, a, in 2001, I, I read the Kitchen Confidential and I read the Italian version, okay? And then I went online and then I, I emailed Les Halles. There was the restaurant where Anthony Bourdain was working. And I, uh, I said, uh, you know, I wrote an email with my broken English at the time, um, probably still is, uh, where I said, uh, you know, thank you for uh, so much inspirational, you know, uh, book, a uh, piece of, um, uh, book and then, uh, and then uh, Beth, at the time as she was the assistant, Beth Arsley, our assistant of um, Anthony Bourdain, you know, wrote me back and then she sent me, she sent me the original version of the book and uh, she put a kiss in it and Anthony Bourdain wrote, uh, wrote a knife and he, and he wrote, uh, and for Enzo, cook free or die. And this is something remains and inspired me forever. You know, cook what you feel, you know, never really, well, unless, you know, you have to do, develop something for someone else. If you have the chance and the, and the, and the fortune, you know, to, to cook for whatever you want to cook, just cook what you feel, just cook whatever you want to, you know, you want to cook. Because it's, as again, going back to my quote, is the way you express yourself. So you can't really express someone else, someone else's feelings. You're going to express yourself. So this is a, one thing. Uh, and measure things, cook free or die. 
Cook free or die. Remember that, guys. Cook free or die, yeah. (laughs) In general, I would say uh, when you do this job, this when you go through this career, uh, this is not really a job. This is a a lifestyle. This is something that goes over. Uh, When everybody else enjoys, you work. You work weekends, you work evenings. It's a lot of sacrifice, a lot, a lot of sacrifice compared in general with any other you know, jobs. Um, so just you know, be aware of that, do that with passion, you know, do that you know, with yourself, learn the techniques, learn the tradition, learn where you come from, learn the ingredients, um, you know, and then cook free or die. <laughs> yes. And so where will we see you in the next few years? Can you give us a hint or a preview of some of the plans, some of the projects that you're excited about in the future? Well, you know, you never know because you live, live in George in Gruzia. No, sorry, sorry. Sacartuelo. <laughs> Sacartuelo. That's how we say it. <laughs> I wanted to say George, I don't know what comes out in Russian. But I, I want to, you know, I, I, then, you know, la, 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 this last year, in, in 2019, I had a yeah. chance to go to Montenegro for three months. I developed uh, uh, Mudra, Arcusin, Bashar, Pensoneri. So I'm always open to, you know, to, to do some other jobs. I've been asked now to, to look, uh, you know, some, a, a couple of projects coming up in Armenia as well, in Yerevan. But uh, I definitely will be in Georgia. I mean, I'm based in Georgia, you know. Uh, I'm going, uh, I'm going to be, soon 50 years old and then so i don't want to really move anymore probably i will move and come back you know move and come back if i have a chance to do i'm always open to do something abroad but i know i i keep georgia you know as uh, as my country now um and i, I am uh, i am developing a, a new restaurant i just developed a, a downtown as a brand chef uh, in Marjanishvili, um but then i'm, I'm developing now with the guia piradashvili il cortile restaurant which is based in Cajeti, inside of a chateau hotel, uh, Chateau Mere. And uh, we, we're building up together now this uh, a fusion Italian-Georgian restaurant. Fusion so Italian. Be- yeah, yeah, we're going we gotta, we gotta to play with some chocolate in Cali. I'm going to make upset some more Georgians. <laughs> you know that I have a personal page of a fusion, Ge- where Georgian food meets Italian food every day in my kitchen. That's my slogan yeah. for Cemo Gemo. Yeah. So yeah. That's, yeah. I, that's, uh, that's going to be the first restaurant that I go to when I come to Cajeti in, in Georgia. Yeah, you are, you be- because it's my dream to actually w- learn from you uh, that, that artistic recipe that I have in my mind that I'll share with you. See, we, we learn from each other. We always learn from each other. Yeah. I learn every day. I, you know, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, I had a chance to have uh, my first J-1 visa internship with uh, Fabio Trabocchi. He's a, a, a talented chef and he owns five restaurants now, which is two of uh, Michelin star in a Georgetown in Miami and a new one in Venezia in Italy. And I went there in 2006 because I wanted to learn the sous vide techniques. It was doing everything sous vide. So um, I, I, I was able to go to Elias Mursan, who was a Michelin star restaurant at the time in uh, Barrio Salamanca in Madrid, and then to learn a little bit about molecular gastronomy. You know, I always, been, I always believed, you know, then you have to develop yourself. You know, if you want to grow, you're going to invest time and resources to develop yourself. And if you're lucky enough that someone gives you this opportunity to teach you, you know, that's welcome and, and, and anyway. But I, yeah. I do believe also that we always learn from each other. Yeah, you know, yeah. You, you know, you're the best. If you think that you are right, probably it's time to change your career. I've learned a lot from you. I've learned from many mentors. And I'll just want to tell you uh, that uh, recently, you know, I, I lost my grandmother, who was a big mentor in my life. Right. She was like the boss in our family, you know, just recently, right near uh, the new year. And uh, there are two things that she did that gave her a lot of energy that all of us miss, all of us who know her. And she provided her attention to everyone. She was like a human Facebook that recorded everyone's birthdays. And if you didn't remember them, she would be the person who would basically connect you. To that person, and then she was, recognition. She was the, data, the database. The database, and she recognized everyone and give gave everyone their time, regardless of whether or not they were her family or I wasn't friends. Random. 
Dinara, Dinara, Din, Dinara. 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 Color, Dinara. Dinara. Yeah. And Dinara. your attitude and your motto, I think, is to give attention and to give recognition to everyone. And uh, you add flavor and taste to uh, every, every relationship and everyone that you come across to, from what I have observed, from what I've seen in my life as well. So you've definitely added a lot of flavor and energy and excitement you know, to my, uh, to, uh, to my uh, current goals and interests in life as well. So I thank you for that. So cooking, like living for yourself, has no taste also, as, as, what I, as I believe. And speaking about our discussions uh, on time and temperature, you know, I think it's, it's today, in 2020, to increase, increase the generosity that we have and increase that attention and that recognition to others so that we increase not just the time and the temperature uh, and its importance in our recipes, and food, with you. but let's increase the time and the temperature in the relationships with other people I agree with whom you. we come across. And that's what I would love to, you know, for people to understand who are going to listen to this. Yeah. I agree with you. Any comments on that? You. I agree okay. with you. So let's stretch ourselves. Let's lift others. Let's be more generous and, Go to Enzo Neri's website. Uh, if you have any other questions, if you want to be inspired and you want to cook the next best dish, uh, uh, you know, do it for some, somebody else. Like he says, cook free. Be generous. Cook free, right? Yeah. Get, yeah, yeah. Evoke emotions out of other people's lives and do something that's going to connect you to others. Do you know, do you know that I have done a, a charity event in Zegui, in Shketa, um, where there were 80 people that are homeless and there were 15 kids. It was the 1st of June 2019 for the Children's Day. And then uh, I did for this, you know, I did because I wanted to cook for them because for me also cooking is loving, you know. Well, what a mom does, the first things that your mom did when you're born, it put your head to that breast and fed you, you know. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's what was my, my intention. You know, I wanted to share some love, some, some, some energy, you know, through the food and, and to make one day of happiness of these people that are a little bit less fortunate than us. You're a philanthropist, absolutely. That's Someone who has a purpose and a passion. Thank you for reminding me about that detail. And I saw that. I saw the interviews that you did. I saw you on TV. And so... So thank you very much for your time. www.ensoneri.com, E-N-Z-O-N-E-R-I.com. It's a great website where you can learn more about him and see some of the artistic dishes that he creates because I think we've, talked, we've spoken about you as a chef and as a leader, as a scientist, but as an artist, I'll have to share some of those photos of your dishes with my audience and those who are going to listen. I, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and good luck in anything you do. Uh, keep going to find people. And then, uh, you know, I'll speak to you soon and I'll wait you to Georgia, you know, from, uh, from uh, wherever you, you know, you have a time and uh, you live for your house there in New York and then come back for a visit in, uh, in Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's, let's greet everyone in, in the three languages that we have in common, right? So thank you. <laughs> Madloba. Grazie a tutti. Okay, so and I will say thank you very much. Uh, I see you later. Um, not when this or Kargat and ciao. Not when this, yeah. ciao. Not when. Arrivederci. Ciao. ciao.